Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our Philip Securities Research Morning Call for the 4th of October, 2020. Uh, so for today, we'll have a few stock counter updates on Amazon. We have our Singapore REITs monthly. Uh, for Philip on the ground, we have Oxpay Financials and Big Plus. And then we'll round off with the macro outlook on uh, Singapore Weekly. So uh, I'd like to pass my time now to my colleague, Tim, to uh, continue. Uh, thanks. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, we initiate coverage on Amazon.com uh, Incorporated, uh, based in the US, uh, titled Much More Growth Ahead. Next slide. Okay, just some background on Amazon. Uh, they're the largest e-commerce platform in the US uh, by far. So they have a 40% market share uh, compared to the second, which is Walmart at 7%. Uh, just some context, 63% of US households have Amazon Prime membership and estimated over 70% of people uh, go directly to buy Amazon, uh, to Amazon to buy things uh, whenever they shop online. Uh, this is this, this uh, market share and dominance is supported by its vast logistic, logistics arm. Uh, so currently, Amazon Logistics is the third largest partial, parcel shipper uh, in the US. So if you look at the image at the bottom middle, uh, that's all their fulfillment centers in the US. And they're the third largest ahead of FedEx. So they are bigger than FedEx. Uh, and they ship about 70%, or over 70% of their packages uh, in the US offering one to two day shipping in many regions. Uh, the next business for Amazon is their cloud uh, services platform. They're the largest globally with 32% market share uh, compared to the second number two, which is Microsoft Azure at 20%. Uh, some background, uh, the, cloud, uh, the cloud services uh, platform, what it is is it allows businesses and individuals to use computing resources such as databases, memory messaging and uh, programs such as virtual machines on using the internet rather than uh, maintaining or investing their own data centers on site. So they can access all these databases on the web. And that's why it's called the cloud. Uh, so Amazon is not only the largest, but they're also scaling up the fastest, spending the most uh, on the hyperscale data centers. So if you look at the bottom right-hand corner, uh, that's an example of a hyperscale data center. And there's only a few hundred in the world, uh, about 600. Okay. And the last business is uh, Amazon Ads. So they are the third largest digital ad platform in the US with 10% market share. Uh, for Google and Facebook, they, they are the top two. So Google has about 29%, Facebook about 24%. Uh, but however, Amazon is catching up with them. So we'll mention that, uh, we'll talk about that later. The main markets for Amazon is the US 68% of revenue, followed by Germany, UK, Japan, all single digits uh, in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the rest of the world. Okay, next slide. Okay, our first investment thesis is we see much more upside to the Amazon Web Services, which is uh, Amazon's cloud business. Uh, so the cloud business, the cloud IT spend in, in the in the global uh, compared to global IT budgets, it's only about four percent. So only four percent of the global IT spend of three point six trillion uh, is in the cloud. And and the pandemic has ac accelerated this shift. So if you look at the chart on the bottom left hand corner, uh, people are spending more and more on the cloud rather than spending on their own, on on establishing their own data centers and on site uh, infrastructure. And this is this is for several reasons. Uh, so first reason is because um, there's a more hybrid workforce, so there's a lot of more remote working. So we need people to be able to access your computing resources from anywhere in the world. And there's also a, a bigger need for higher data security uh, right now with a lot of hackers around. And, and most companies don't have the expertise to, to have security uh, with regards to the databases. And of course, running their own data center, they don't have the expertise also. Uh, there's other services provided, such as uh, data analytics that come along with the cloud. So if you have all your data inside, uh, you can in fact use all these services uh, that, are, that are inbuilt into these cloud services. And the good thing is that it's a pay as you go model. So you pay by the second you use. 
you don't pay for the storage of your data, but you pay for the second, the number of seconds that you use the data for, and you use the computing power for. So it's a very, uh, it's a very transparent pricing model. Okay, so we, we think that Amazon will be able to capture much of this growth as people shift more into the cloud. Uh, we, uh, we forecast 33% revenue growth for this segment, AWS, with a very high margin of 32% operating margin. And this translates to 64% of total operating income for this year alone. So it's the highest contributor to operating income. So the reason why we think Amazon is going to capture much of this growth, not only because they, they have the biggest market share already, but they rank the best in terms of reliability and execution. And also, uh, and along with this, they offer similar pricing to Amazon's Azure. So they offer better services uh, for the same price. The second reason is because they are, they are, they are very big in scale. So they're able to secure these uh, larger scale contracts such as government contracts. So in the US, they have this Department of Defense contract, multi-billion dollar one that only Amazon AWS and Microsoft Azure is able to, to meet the requirements of. And we expect this, uh, and this contract is expected to be rewarded uh, next year in April as a medium term catalyst. The last point is uh, Amazon is scaling much faster than all competitors in, in this space. So they're the highest spender in hyperscale data centers for the past four quarters. So if you look at the chart in the bottom right hand corner, you can see Amazon's capex, uh, capital expenditures, uh, is the blue line way above uh, all its competitors, Alphabet, uh, Microsoft, and Facebook. So those are the reasons why we think uh, Amazon will be able to capture most of this growth that is coming from the cloud space. Next slide. So uh, just some charts to, to illustrate the, the lead of uh, Amazon's AWS cloud. So if you look at the chart on the left-hand side, Amazon Web Services is at the top, uh, substantially higher than all the rest of the competitors in terms of leadership in this space. Uh, so we can, and so, and so we see that they're capturing more, much of the growth. Uh, the revenue growth has been growing at a component annual growth rate of 29% over the past five years, expected to continue, accelerated by the pandemic. <clears throat> okay, uh, next slide, please. Okay, our second investment thesis is uh, Amazon's advertising uh, continues to take market share in the US digital marketing space. Um, so, for Amazon ads, uh, it's mostly ads on its website that set sellers pay for to promote their items uh, using Amazon's data to target people, the, the, the buyers on the site. So if you look at the image on the right, top right-hand corner, those are examples of the ads that are on Amazon.com. So uh, the reason why we, we <clears throat> the catalyst for Amazon's advertising uh, taking more market share, firstly, is Apple's iOS 14 privacy update. So this update requires of people using apps on the Apple devices uh, to give consent for them to be tracked. So, uh, so for example, for, for Facebook apps, if, if they want to track you as you move around the web and stuff and, and do and browse the websites and stuff, uh, they will have to click on, they have to give you consent. They have to give Facebook consent to do that. And what, and what we're saying is that 75% of Apple users are opting out. So they're not giving consent to Facebook and other advertisers to, to track them. And what, is, and what this is doing is <clears throat> I, we see a less effectiveness of Facebook ads as users can't be tracked outside of Facebook app. But Amazon is unaffected by this because Amazon tracks people inside the Amazon.com app and not outside. So that's what we call first party uh, data. So, so as people are reporting less effectiveness of uh, Facebook ads, uh, marketing agencies are seeing a shift in spending from Facebook to Amazon. Uh, the second point is Google's cookie ap apocalypse. So similar to uh, Apple's privacy update, uh, for Google, they'll be, they'll be phasing out third-party cookies on Chrome by 2022 next year. Uh, so third-party cookies are similar to, to the Apple's privacy update. So, the cookies will help you to track people, what they do outside of the website. Wherever they go, they will browse other websites, they'll be tracked by these third-party cookies. So Google will, <clears throat> Google will not allow this uh, moving forward next year. And so marketers will, will have, marketers that rely on this third-party data will have to consider alternative first-party data strategies 
such as Amazon Ads. So that is another look at this. Uh, next here. So the third point is uh, Amazon is expanding its ads ad, ad capacity and services as well. So they doubled the sponsor ad space uh, from two to three to as much as six now. So you can see as much as six ads appearing on a page. And also they are, they are introducing new ad formats such as video ads and sponsored brand products, uh, brand posts. So despite this uh, higher supply, we're still seeing ad prices rise. So this is due to surging demand. Uh, so prices rose from 93 cents to $1.20 per average cost per click, 30% up since the start of 2021. So uh, we see, so ads is expected to be the fastest growing segment for, for Amazon. It's expected to contribute uh, the remaining operating income besides from the cloud. So, so Amazon's main uh, in operating income contributors are the cloud and advertising. And advertising has the highest margins, estimated to be above 50%. Okay, next slide. <clears throat> okay, now last thesis is the core e-commerce business uh, still expanding its mode. So Amazon is already leading with 40% market share in the US, uh, but its capex is outspending all competitions. So the fulfillment centers, uh, which is where Amazon packs and distributes all, all the items that they ship. I expected to jump 44% over the coming years uh, to 578 million square feet as uh, they boost the capex. And how this helps to build the moat is firstly through uh, fulfillment, uh, fulfillment by Amazon. So fulfillment by Amazon is this service that Amazon uh, offers to sellers where they pack the items for them and then they ship out the items for them. Uh, and they keep the items in the warehouse for them. Everything is done on the fulfillment site. So this is the key reason reason why uh, sellers choose to sell on Amazon because it is very scalable. It saves very, a lot of time and enjoys a very wide re regional reach for the deliveries. Uh, rather than you have to choose which carrier you want to use like FedEx or DHL, uh, just to reach certain regions. Uh, so, this is, so by expanding this, they will expand the mode with the sellers. Uh, the second point is it helps with faster shipping. Uh, it offers more regions to one uh, one to two day shipping, and this will help with the buyer side. So more uh, is expected to grow the number of buyers on the site. So the Amazon Prime members, uh, which is a gauge of the recurring shoppers and Amazon, is expected to top 100, 153 million uh, next year, by next year, or 63% of total US households. And already 74% of US consumers already go to Amazon directly to buy. Key reason is because of the fast shipping. So we expect Amazon's e-commerce sale to continue to outpace uh, the US retail sales. If you look at the chart on the right-hand side, the Amazon, <coughs> Amazon's product growth year on year is uh, sub substantially higher than the, uh, the normal US, re US retail uh, sales growth. And we expect this to continue with Amazon uh, gain also gaining market share in the e-commerce space. Next slide, please. Okay, our valuation is uh, using discounted cash flow model uh, with a target price of $4,329 uh, based on a WAC of 6.2% and a terminal growth rate of 5%. The terminal growth rate 5% is higher compared to the long-term US uh, average GDP growth of 3.2%, mainly because Amazon is the leader in both the fast-growing cloud market and the fast-growing digital ads market uh, in the US. That's why we forecast a higher growth than the the, the average US GDP growth. Okay, with that, I'll pass my time on to Natalie for a read monthly. Thank you, Timothy, and good morning, everyone. Okay, so now moving on to Singapore REITs monthly. Okay, the graph on the left hand side, you can see that the, the REIT index, which is in blue, is currently underperforming the STI in green, the uh, STI in red, as well as the real estate developer index in green. So in the last one month, the REIT index has lost about 0.5% of share price. Um, the, the biggest piece of news that happened uh, in September, 17 September to be specific, was the inclusion of seven, uh, 11 S REITs into the EPRA NARI developed index. Okay, so this is one of the more widely followed in indices. Um, and inclusion into the index basically just means that um, the ET, the tracking ETFs and the funds that are tracking the Apronarit Development Index will also have to buy a position of 
these um, respective uh, S-reads that are in the index. So that, of course, will boost uh, visibility, liquidity uh, for, for the S-reads. So presently, there are uh, 28 S-reads that are included in this EPRA NARI developed index, up from 17 um, previously. Okay, next slide, please. Um, this is how the interest rates have been uh, moving. Um, the, the lines that we are paying most attention to are the red line, which is the 10-year SGS or 10-year bond yield, as well as the, the three-month saw in, in blue. Okay. Uh, so more or less, the interest rates have been relatively stable. 10-year um, bond yield as at 24 September is about 1.49%. Um, three months saw about 0.22%. So according to Bloomberg consensus, um, the, the, the forecast is that the 10-year SGS yield will remain below 2% from 2021 to 2022 before crossing the 2% level in 2023. Yeah. Okay, so we have, we have about another 0.5% um, to go for the rest of this year as well as next year. Okay, so in overall, we expect the interest rates to be kept, uh, interest rate growth to be kept in the near term, and we expect the DPU recovery to outpace this interest rate growth. Next slide, please. Okay, this is the uh, S REIT um, sh share price, uh, which is the REIT index the, in black blue, as well as the dividend yield spread in dark blue. So presently at uh, with a dividend yield of 4.1%, um, the yield spread is at 2.7%, and that is at the negative 1.1 standard deviation level, uh, which is somewhere near the lower green uh, line. Okay. But in terms of the forward um, dividend yield, um, it is expected to be about 5.1% according to Bloomberg forecast, or rather the consensus forecast. Uh, and that will translate to a dividend yield spread of about 3.4%, which is actually at the average, at the average um, dividend yield spread, the red line. Okay. So um, all in, I guess this just means that uh, currently the, the REITs are trading at a negative 1.1 deviation level. And you know, the forward, one year forward dividend yield spread is actually expected to be higher um, at close to the average we need to say that there's still some um there's still there's still some upside if you were to buy into REITs now as you will be buying cheaper and getting getting an average you a higher average you okay okay yeah average you spread sorry yeah okay uh, next slide please okay this is the dividend uh dpu growth um so over the over the course of um, this year, year to date, we have actually um, revised our share price uh, slightly. Um, the, the REITs that have um, share, their share prices uh, reviewed are, for example, um, CICT, FCT for the retail component. Um, as initially we forecasted that there will not be any rental rebates. However, it seems that uh, there, there is still some need to provide rental relief for some of the tenants. And also, not to mention, there was a mandated 0 0.5 months uh, rental relief or rental waiver uh, mandated by the government. Okay. Um, the other REITs that, have, that we have adjusted the share price include um, some of the US uh, or overseas office REITs like Manulife Prime and iREIT. So Manulife Prime is because um, oh, the physical occupancies at the offices in the US still remain relatively low, and that has weighed on the car park income as well as uh, warranted some rental reliefs for ancillary retail um, tenants. So that of course uh, took out some of the some of the recovery. Okay, in terms of uh, in terms of I read, uh, I think there was an acquisition that resulted in a DPU dilutive, um, FI21 DPU, yeah. Okay, so now moving on to the next slide. It's our retail subsector. So um, in, in September, there was a new round of tightening in safe management measures that was announced 
and it's expected to, to run from 27 September to 24 October. So in this new round of tightening, the group sizes for gatherings as well as dine-ins has been reduced from five to two. Okay. And the government will be providing a third round of the RSS, which stands for Rental Support Scheme. So the government provided uh, two, early, two earlier um, rounds of RSS for the, for the two periods of the Phase 2 heightened alert in May, as well as in July, in the July-August uh, period. So each of them amounted to 0 0.5 months. And they also mandated that the landlords under the RWF, which stands for Rental Waiver Framework, that the, they also mandated that the private landlords will have to provide 0 0.5 months of rental waiver for SME tenants who have experienced more than 20% decline in uh, revenue uh, for, the, for the May as well as the July, August period. So whether or not um, the landlords will still be mandated uh, in this round of tightening, uh, that has yet to be seen. There's been no announcements. Yeah. So the so um for the third round of the RSS, uh, more details will be released in in October, early October. Okay. Uh, next slide, please. So this slide um this slide shows us the retail sales value um on the left hand side as well as the F and B services value on the right hand side. So overall, what we can see is that the, um, you know, despite the tightening and the tightening of the measures and the loosening of the measures, the retail sales index has been relatively stable. Um, it has trended between negative three, but negative three, to negative eighteen percent of uh, two thousand nineteen levels. Okay, and currently in July, um, the the retail sales value is uh, down by about eight point four percent compared to July 2019 levels. Moving on to the F&B services uh, value, okay, we can see that um, this index has been more affected by the tightening of group as well as dining restrictions. So the red line, which shows us 2021's um, F&B services value, uh, it has been hit by the gray, uh, sorry, the, sh the shaded blue areas, which is of course the phase two heightened alert period. Um, and this data is on a lagging basis. So we still don't have data for August as well as September. Um, however, we know that because of the tightening, the phase two heightened alert period in towards the end of July and August, start of August, we know that the FFB services index will definitely be impacted because um, during that period, the dining, the dining um, was, was actually um, banned again. Yeah. Okay. Similarly, we do expect that there will be some sort of impact, impact for the um, August tightening period. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Moving on to the hospitality sector, uh, the graph on the left hand side shows us the international visitor arrivals in red, which as you can see is still 99% below August 2019 levels. Uh, for REFPA, we are about 57% down from July 2019 levels. <clears throat> so July's hotel REFPA actually grew 16% month on month on the back of a 19% increase in room rates. August data is likely to support to be supported by the quarantine business. So in the month of August, uh, there were 90 hotels booked uh, up from 70 that were booked in May. And this was due to the spike in um, local local cases that we were experiencing in August. However, of course, with the uptick, uh, with the the new tightening that that will run from September to October, we expect an uptick in cancellation and postponements um, due to the two packs group size imposed. Yeah. Okay, um, one step forward, one step back, because. Uh, you know, the vaccinated travel lane, which kicked in on the 8th of September, is starting with Germany and Brunei. So two weeks into that scheme, Singapore actually received 900 travellers with only one COVID-19 case detected upon arrival. And, and initially, Singapore was very um, excited, looking forward to actually opening, opening up, expanding this um, vaccinated travel lane to more countries. 
Um, however, the rise in local cases may deter prospective visitors and decelerate the expansion of the vaccinated travel lane scheme. Next slide, please. Okay, so this for, for this uh, month, you only have data for the retail as well as the hospitality sector. So that's about it. And we wrap, wrap things up with our uh, Philips stock call. So for the REITs under our coverage, we expect them to deliver about 3.9% uh, to 9.7% DPU yield for FY21. And that's all for me. I'll now pass the time on to Paul for Singapore Weekly. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks, Natalie. Next page. Okay, we'll just highlight some um, macro numbers that came out from Singapore. Uh, the first will be dental outpatient attendees. So this is an industry number. So for August, the, the number was still strong. It was up uh, 32%, uh, even faster than the July 21, 18%. Uh, the, both numbers are important because they will give us a, a, a peek into how dental attendees or admissions uh, are occurring in the September quarter. So at least for the first two months in September, the number is up 26% year on year. So uh, it should be an, a rough indicator of how hopefully you know, Q&M should perform in the third quarter's uh, results. Uh, the other two numbers that came out in Singapore was, were the price index, the property price index. For, for the resi price index, uh, it was up modestly about 1% quarter on quarter. Uh, year on year is up seven. Uh, so this is a good number actually. So that uh, we, if you no, know, as you may recall, we mentioned that any double digit rise is always alarming. I mean, that's what the real estate agents tend to, uh, as a rule of thumb, I guess. Uh, so right now it's only up seven, uh, and if it's double digit like ten percent, then then you if over five years, like you always say fifty percent, that's that may cause some alarm bells. But right now it's only up seven percent uh, over twelve months. Uh, furthermore, when you take a longer term perspective, you know, the resi price index is only up, uh, I mean, less than seven, uh, around less than 7% less than over eight years. So I wouldn't call it like uh, uh, alarming or raging levels. Uh, the other index that came out was uh, uh, HDB. So HDB was much stronger. I mean, it was up 3% quarter on quarter. Over the past 12 months, uh, HDB prices are up 4, 15%. So this is going to be supportive for the prior resi as, you know, uh, as we get this uh, HDB upgraders you know, as the value of the homes rise and then they can upgrade to private property. Uh, again, when we look at, on, at the longer term level from, compared to the previous peak, uh, uh, prices are virtually flat. Uh, so over the, from 2013 uh, to, to now, I think the pop HDB price index is up uh, less than 2%. Uh, so it's hardly changed uh, over the past eight years. Uh, in, in the US, we got a more inflation numbers showing that uh, inflation continues to rise. Uh, I, I won't run too deep on this, but uh, then later on, we'll discuss later on uh, a briefing by Vic Plus, a company that has no, probably not presented for the last few years, so we will share. We also had Oxpay, uh, or for me known as MC Payments Pones, we have been able to share some highlights. We also give you some update on our, our usual model portfolio. Uh, tactically, no, despite the social uh, social restrictions that have been imposed recently, uh, the Singapore economy is still trending out. I think most indicators are still positive. So third quarter should still be a good quarter. Um, right now, I think as interest rates begin to bottom and inflation pressures are building up everywhere. So interest rate beneficiaries should be like the banks or, or even the SGX. Uh, the, uh, we will just have a couple of charts since the talking point now is about energy. Uh, so we do see upside in energy or even coal prices. So we'll just share later on. Uh, for in terms of the the key key news events, uh, uh, should be the Friday number again. That's where payrolls will come. So if we get a strong payrolls, I think the interest rates might actually react and, and climb higher. Uh, in terms of points we've been for this week, we have Tuan Sing. It should be interesting because they, they hardly do any webinars or meet investors. So it'll be an interesting one. Uh, it'll be tomorrow. So those who are interested, uh, do, do register. Uh, we also on Saturday have our usual quarterly Singapore strategy briefing if anyone's interested. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> uh, we'll, up, we'll do the usual COVID uh, update globally. I think the good news is that the global cases and, and even mortality are now hitting a record. Uh, the year lows, I think when you look at the whole of from January to September, 
at least motel read rates and so forth. So hopefully this indication that the vaccination is, is, is effective. Uh, and we continue to decline in terms of the new cases. Uh, there are many countries looking, I think the key one will be the US, uh, although no details has been announced, but it will be the one that everyone should, should, will be watching whether early November there are plans by the US to reopen their borders to the vaccinated. The key one, of course, will be the Atlantic, no Europe to, to US. Uh, of course, we also heard news that you no know, Australia is opening up to their own citizens. Okay. Uh, next slide. Uh, okay, um, uh, again, this is our Singapore number. I, I won't, won't go too deep, but the, just to show you, when you do a compilation of the 10-day gaps, we are in the fifth doubling, more than doublings. I mean, a doubling cycle. I mean, 400, 1,003. I think you can see the numbers. It's just for your, for your reference. Uh, next slide. Okay, in terms of the property market, so I just share on the table on the left. So this is the property price index, Singapore, the residential price index since 2008. Uh, as you know, after GFC, we got this huge rally, 62%. Uh, then in 2013 or third quarter, we got the imposition of TDSR, then the property price you know, collapsed. Uh, then when they relaxed the SSD, which is around seller stamp duty, just a little bit, then the market zoomed up to almost 9% on a 12-month basis and the authorities clamped down with another increase in ABSD. Uh, so the last 12 months is up to only 7%. So this should not raise any alarm bells by the authorities in terms of uh, cooling measures because it's not exceeding you know, the so-called double-digit level. Uh, the one on the right uh, is just to show the, the HDB prices. So we all, we, there was a, everyone had a good time. Uh, third quarter 05 to 2013, you know, HDB prices doubled. Since then, it just moved sideways. Uh, it's only now that we broke uh, to a new record. Uh, the last 12 months has been especially steep, uh, almost 15%. Again, this just for illustration. Uh, next slide. Uh, okay, it, there was also some data points on the population. Uh, again, this is just for everyone's reference. Uh, so you can see the table on the left. The bar is the net change in population. So you can see that we probably lost like 200,000, probably the worst since independence, I can't, I can't get any more data from that, but you can see that the population uh, in Singapore dropped back to 2014 levels. Uh, if there's any read from it, it'd be just that uh, this is not good for the domestic economy or for domestic consumption. Uh, I guess it's, it, seems, it seems all right for property market, but anyway, just for illustration, uh, the one on the right is just, you know, we just always have a white paper check uh, just, to, just out of interest. So, uh, if you just look on the, the bar, the blue bar basically shows the current population. This was the red bar is the low target for 2020 and then the high target for 20. So we're not even reaching the 2020 targets. Uh, again, this is just for reference. I'm not going to help us make any decisions on the stock market, but uh, this is just for reference. Uh, next slide. Okay, uh, so the news everywhere is about the high uh, energy prices. Uh, and it might get worse because as winter approaches, uh, as we reopen and then as we travel, then the demand for energy, especially jet fuel and all, might, might even rise even further. So the table on the left is just to show you coal prices. It has hit a uh, record high. Uh, Again, this Newcastle, so there are all types of prices. I see yeah, some are 40 depending on the quality of the coal, but we just use a benchmark, the Newcastle. So it's hitting almost $200. Uh, then if you look at the European gas prices, also another record high. So one of the reasons, again, this is just for info, uh, is as we pivot uh, more towards renewable and you no know, renewable like solar and wind is intermittent. Uh, basically means not reliable, uh, intermittent. Uh, because you basically have to rely on the weather for energy. So this time around, when you don't have enough solar or wind, uh, uh, they, have to they have to actually... Uh, and there wasn't much of a hydro too. So then they have to scramble for power and they have to actually, the Europeans are actually buying a lot of the, the coal, not to mention the Chinese. And so as a result, you can see this huge jump uh, in coal prices uh, in just, a, 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 just to give you a, a summary of the situation. So the thing is that this may not be a one-off event. Uh, if you keep on re relying on renewables where there's no base load, no, there's no consistent power, then everything all depends on the on the, uh, on the weather, whether you get enough energy. So as a result, this volatility may continue. But anyway, next slide. Uh, okay, the electricity curbs was a, a bit something that we were a bit more interested in because this will affect the electronic supply chain. 
Um, so just we, we also wanted to just to understand the situation just using data, uh, the numbers out there. So you can see why the there is so in the table on the left, you can see the electric de electricity demand in China, the blue line. So it was last year it was zero, but this year electricity demand in China spiked up to 15%. But you can see coal production could not keep pace. Even at most coal production, you see the red line, usually at most you need can grow 5% because China is already producing 4 billion tons a year of thermal. Uh, and there's no way, I mean, how are they going to jump like 10%? So as a result, uh, there's a mismatch. There isn't enough coal to, to, to meet the local de uh, demand for power, which just jumped up 15%. Uh, no, as China is the biggest guzzler of power since they are the manufacturer to everyone. <laughs> uh, and also, uh, the other one is hydro, the blue line. Uh, hydro is about 20% of China needs, but hydro is not giving much this year, so it's actually down. So as a result, uh, the Chinese have to cut either cut power or even you know, uh, um, import more coal, like, like somewhere like Indonesia. Um, and also... But the main reason also we think, again, we're not China experts, but you have to ask our Hong Kong desk, but uh, you can see the table on the right. So the table on the right is, uh, is just the, in this, is the stats that we get from China about the losses in power company. So you can see that whenever coal price increase, then there are power plants that lose money. Uh, uh, that's because, you know, in China, electricity prices are fixed. So whenever coal prices rise, they have to absorb all these losses. So you can see whenever the red line rise, then the losses will rise. Uh, right now, what you see year to date, uh, the RMB coal price, the red one on the right hand side, is about nine hundred. But if you take September, September coal price in China is about thousand three. So you can see if they keep on produce, if they keep on, the more power they sell, the more losses they have. So we think these power curves could continue for some time uh, uh, until coal prices kind of normalize. But as winter is coming, right, so this could worsen the situation. So this would mean even put. Uh, supply chain into an even more tighter position. The, I mean, this is what we think, I mean, based on the data that we have. Again, we're not uh, power experts, on, especially in China, uh, but we're just looking at all the data just to get a sense of the situation. Uh, next slide. So moving back to our usual uh, Philip on the ground. So Oxpay did a poems webinar with us. Uh, so what they do, they are a merchant payment system. Uh, I mean, basically in a nutshell, what they do is when you go to Watson, and then you want to pay with your Alipay or whatever, then the, the lady gives you that, that, that terminal, that physical terminal or online website. So that is theirs. Uh, so they, they give us a more a rough sense of how it works. So if a customer pays $100, you know, uh, the money, $2 is split between... Issue. This is not the exact amount, but they're just trying to give an illustration. Some of it is shared with the issuer, the bank. Some of it is shared with the card company. Then Oxpay will take like 40 cents of it. Uh, this may not be the actual number, but this is just an illustration again. Uh, some of the merchants that they work with is Zara, Watson, and, and, and Mango. I think you can see the names there. Uh, apart from you know, just processing the payment, they all will also give you know, inventory data, customer data for the customer. Uh, I, I think they, they kind of mentioned that to grow this business, they're looking more at m &As. I can expect so because, how, I mean, it's, got, it's going to be, take a long time to acquire one merchant. Imagine you go one shop by one shop to acquire. It's, it's going to be time-consuming and expensive. And the process is too long. So they are looking at m and and they will work with partners like SM, SAP to grow their merchants. Um, so the way, uh, my own understanding is that I think how they managed to get a big breakthrough in the early years was because they were the first one in, like in Singapore to offer WeChat and Alipay, WeChat Pay and Alipay to merchants. So, so I think that, that was how they got their head start. I believe, I think the way they said it. Uh, in terms of new products would be, you know, buy now, pay later, which seems like another type of credit card. But anyway, uh, they're also trying to build uh, cryptocurrency and digital tokens into their terminals. Uh, most of the merchants that grew was Indonesia, but this is an associate. And the first half is still losing money. So, uh, yeah, I mean, this is just data. So for the first half, they are uh, 700,000 profit and 6 million revenue. Again, this just just for your info, for those who want to understand what this company does. Uh, next, next slide. Okay, the other one, I guess a bit more interesting is the, the Vic Plus. So this one, at least we think there's a higher barrier entry than uh, maybe doing merchant acquiring. Um, so this company is, is a very unusual company. They do pipes 
for construction and they do medical products. Uh, I'm not sure how it came about to this, but but anyway, so they were been listed since 1999. So the pipe manufacturing, but most of the profits come from medical. Uh, I'll, I'll explain some of it later on. Uh, so they're trading, I think, uh, yeah, rough, rough, roughly about maybe 10 times P. Uh, so for pipes, they are money to PVC pipes and they are one of the, I think they are like probably the largest supplier to all the HDBs and BTOs, HIP. Uh, the, 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 but I think the jewel would be their medical business, which is the forefront medical. So this company uh, has been around since 2000. So this is not something that they, they just did the last couple of years. They've been doing this, involved in this business for, for I don't know, almost two decades. Uh, uh, so what they do is, uh, uh, okay, so in the picture there, the picture one, so these are like springs. Uh, so these are like during the hernia operation, uh, the painful hernia operation. So there's a mesh, there's like a netting to cover the wound. And then you need these screws to kind of keep it in place. And the, the technology is high because these screws that they make actually stays in the body according to them. So they're not doing the, the basic like injection or inoculation uh, or needles or so. So the other product they do is the chemotherapy tube and needles that, is, that you can see on the right. So they're doing very high uh, complex products. So the barrier is of course high. Uh, these are all consumables. So these are one-off use. So they're not like some that only order every five, couple of years. Uh, some of the products I think you can see, uh, their plants are in Singapore and China. I think in China, they are going to expand their capacity by more than 50% uh, because of the demand out there. Uh, they did mention power curbs. So salmon was not affected because it depends on province. But uh, their Changzhou plant in Jiangsu, I think, uh, was they were given like 85% allocation of power. Uh, so the good thing about these products are their long cycle. Uh, once the and they are sole source, most times the medical ones they choose you, they will, they will stick with you for until the end of life, I guess. So some of them have been can last for almost ten years. Uh, so they're of course the very high barriers. I think the medical companies because are not going to trust you to inject these screws into their body, right? So but anyway, the high barriers is that once they validate you, you must continue to use the same machines, the same process, and not change anything because they will actually audit and qualify the exact machine you use and the process and cannot be changed. So this why is a very high barrier to entry business that they have here. Uh, next slide. Uh, okay, we just run through our model portfolio. So we were down, sorry, actually not, not 0.7, I need to, there's an error, that's why. It's minus 1.6. So we were below the market, STI was up 1%. Uh, we were down, we got hit a lot by our reopening stocks. Uh, like escort, uh, escort read, uh, comfort Delgo. These were the ones that hurt the uh, hurt the portfolio performance. Of course, Thai bearish because of the COVID. Uh, and uh, what helped us was actually capital land investment. Uh, but but do know that capital land investment, uh, we actually calculate the returns manually ourselves because we were uh, assuming, uh, they they get the free uh, uh, the the free read shares and of of course they also get the free uh the cash. Uh, because capital land no longer is delisted, so we actually have to calculate the returns ourselves. Yeah. So I need the best performer has been the the capital land investment. Uh, next slide. Okay. Uh, this is just across the board. How did the the industry perform? Uh, the big gainers were like coal coal companies, capital land, the table, the top ten gainers. Just for your info, the losers were the glove makers. Uh, I think because of lower glove prices and of course uh, there was also fears of a uh, windfall tax in, in Malaysia and, and all the, the disruption in production those were all the triggers to the, to the weak performance in, in September you can, you can see uh, the, the gainers I think you can see all the like Hong Kong land they were buying back shares Singtel because of the, all their restructuring announcement uh, again this is just for your info I think we won't go too deep into it I think with that I think we, we can come to the end we can, we can take uh, question answers thanks Yeah, so I think I take the, the top rated question first. The question is, where is SGX going forward? Uh, right now, we, we still have a, a buy rating, accumulate rating on SGX. And for us, we are still optimistic on the outlook for SGX because of three main reasons. The first is the pipeline for IPO and specs are healthy according to, to management. In fact, 
we we believe we may see a listing uh not not, not just for ipos but for specs in the next coming in the, the next few weeks or months uh because when they when uh, you may recall that when sgx launched the spec framework to allow spec listing in singapore they said that uh they expect uh to see a spec listing uh in the next couple of weeks now uh in, in September. So we the, the 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 spec and IPO pipeline is healthy. So we 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 I, I so that's what the, the first reason. The second reason is the volumes uh on the, the ex stock exchange remain healthy. The for for volumes for year to date 2021 is slightly lower than 2020 because 2020 was a record almost a record year for SGX also but the it is lower uh than 2020 by about uh, on average about six to seven percent, but it's still higher uh, for the volumes when we compare this to the average in the last three years. So we look at uh, 2017 to 2019 volumes for 2021 is still higher than, than, than the, the average of the last three years. So that, 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 that's good for SGX. The third reason uh, for, for SGX is that there are new acquisitions uh, Max Trader and BitFX is expected to continue to uh, lead the growth and accelerate the growth for SGX. So in our model, we expect about 10 to 12 percent uh, revenue growth, top line growth from their, their new acquisitions that they made in financial year 2021. So overall for financial year 2022, we, we expect uh, uh, revenue and, 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 and uh, net profit to be stronger. Uh, one main concern for us, one, one slight concern for us for SGX is because they're investing in all these new initiatives for their mid-term growth. So the OPEX that they're going to invest in the, the mid to near term is also uh, higher. It's about 350 to 400 million. That's about 15% uh, increase from financial year 2021. So financial year, because their year, they are year ended uh, there. So, so uh, in the near term, we are positive on the outlook of SJX based on the three factors we mentioned. I, I'm not sure if Glenn has something uh, he, Glenn wants to add on also, but please feel free to add on, Glenn, if you have anything to add on for SJX. I'll just scroll down to see if there's any more questions. Otherwise, I hand over to my colleagues. I think that's all from, from me. Yeah, okay, I'll hand over to my colleagues. Um, I'll take the next question. Uh, a number of REITs, uh, for example, Maple Tree Industrial, Escort REIT, Keppel DC are dropping. Is it due to the interest rate increase? Please comment, thanks. Okay, so um, for the last one month, uh, the REIT index has returned a negative 0.5% uh, in terms of share price. Um, and I think the, across the board, most of the REITs were, were in the red, except for... The, the diversified REITs, which was up by about one percentage point. Um, and I think the one that dragged down the index the most was the hospitality sector. So that, of course, is in the midst of, um, you know, rising cases, uh, especially here in Singapore, as well as in some of the other countries like your UK. Okay, so um, overall, I think it's, uh, it's several reasons. Um, it is no secret that the... REITs are inversely correlated with the interest rate. So um, rise in interest rates, um, or rather the anticipation that the interest rates will rise will have active impact on the REITs. But I think in this case, um, with respect to the hospitality sector, which was down by about 5.9%, um, that was, that was due, sorry, 5.9 percentage points. I think that was large, largely due to the the extension, so to speak, of the recovery timeline, because um, you know, even in Singapore, we see that the the increase or the tightening of measures um, will extend the recovery uh, runway, meaning it will it will push things further down, kick the can down the road. Okay. Um, can you give an update on Dasin Retail Trust, especially with its exclude? With its exclusion from the FTSE Apra Nari Global Index, um, okay. So for for inclusion into the into the in, index,
the inclusion into the index. So some of the ground rules include a liquidity cost. Hello, sorry, it says my connection is unstable. I, I hope that the thing get cut off. Um, okay, so for the inclusion into the index, there usually is uh, some clauses. So it has to you have to you have to reach their liquidity clause, your free float clause, um, amongst others, uh, and. I think for for Dustin, it's not a very um, it's not a very highly traded stock. So that could be one of the reasons why um, it has it has not been included. Um, and also, uh, yes. So for Dustin, right? Um, we it will never ever be included into the developed series. So yeah, it can only ever be included into the 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 what the one of the Asian in the indices. Or the global, yeah. Okay. Um. Yeah. Okay. I'll take this other question. Your high net, your chart shows that the projected DPU growth for the hospitality REITs is uh forty five point eight percent FY twenty one and twenty seven point three percent FY twenty two. Why then is the neutral rating for the sector? Uh, John, if we could, if we could move back to the REITs monthly slides. Okay, so for the, so the the forty five percent growth in DPU for FY twenty one is due to the is due to the low base effect from FY twenty two. Oh, sorry, <laughs> it's due to the low base effect from FY twenty. Okay, so if you look at the graph on the right hand side, you see that for the for the for Escort Residence Trust, despite this forty five point eight percent recovery, the DPU when we compare it to FY19 levels is still not yet back to 100%. In fact, it's only at 58%. Yeah, so while there's a strong recovery in DPU, um, you know, the, the, the recovery back to pre-pandemic levels is really contingent upon, you know, how fast the international travel, international borders are reopened. Yeah, so I hope that answers the question. So for, amongst the, amongst the, um, hospitality names, uh, we are of the opinion that Escort will be the, one of the fastest to recover. And that is because of its exposure to um, you know, the large, large markets with large domestic tourism, such as France, UK, Australia, um, US, yeah. um, China, China also as well. Uh, Japan, Japan also has a relatively large domestic market. So because of Escort's diversification, as well as its exposure to these countries with large domestic markets, I think it was more than 60% of uh, assets are located within these countries. So we, we think that that will actually help Escort recover faster than its peers, uh, which are not so diversified and more concentrated, for example. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and, and also just to mention that we do have a accumulate call on Escort. Um, at, with a target price of one dollar and seventeen cents. Okay. So I'm scrolling down now. I'm trying to see if there's any other questions. Uh, okay, I'll pass the time back to the rest of my colleagues for now. Oh. Yeah. Thank, thanks, Natalie. Oh, yeah. Anyway. Just on the XGX question, um, XGX also don't forget is a beneficiary of uh, rising interest rates, uh, just like the banks, uh, because XGX has, I think, like a twelve or thirteen billion float. Uh, it, when you look at the XGX uh, P and L, right, there's always this thing called treasury income uh, at the derivatives part. That's because when you have uh, open interest, uh, you have to park some margin with XGX. So XGX has this float of of money. As more and more open interest happens, so it's uh you no. Know, if you want to take a position, you have to keep some margin with S with the SGX. So this still continues to build, and when interest rates rise, they will get this big tailwind. So uh, and also, second thing to remember, you know, uh, regardless, I know SGX, you, wherever you want to call them, it's SGX is almost like a casino, right? I mean, it's like it's like a monopoly, uh, a, a platform. Okay, let's not call it casino. It's like a platform. Uh, for financial derivatives, so this is a very rare, still a very rare company to a very rare um, um, um model to own, and also, uh, they've been hit badly because, 
uh, of all the launch of all the recent MSCI projects uh, products in in uh, in Hong Kong, uh, like MSCI MSCI Taiwan. But it, but if you do the data, I think Glenn Nixon uh, will show you that even when they launch all these new MSCI products in Hong Kong. Uh, the Taiwan, the FTSE Taiwan, uh, which which uh, SGX kind of role uh, introduced didn't really hurt. So there's a bit of uh, um, the market took a beating because of all these MSCI products that's coming up from Hong Kong. But when you look at the numbers, it has not really dented the the volumes in terms of taking taking share away from SGX. Okay, but anyway, next time Glenn will show you some of the 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 we'll back it up with some data. Uh, okay, let me just run through some questions. Uh, the the outlook for Thai Bev going forward. Uh, please explain a bit with regard to their business arm, property, and and uh, F and B. Okay. Um, for Thai Bev, the the performance will be kind of flattish, mainly because of the pandemic in Thailand and in Vietnam. So volumes are going to be hurt. Uh, but what has been holding back the operating performance for Thai Bev is they just cut. They, they, they are big cut, uh, cost cut. I think they cut almost a billion Thai baht uh, in cost, uh, in marketing costs and so forth. Uh, of course, that's not uh, the way to go forward. But what we can just say is that uh, they have been very flexible in terms of their cost cutting moves. Uh, so if you look at the results, even though revenue has been fell or, or, or slightly down, they managed to, to just cut a huge amount of cost uh, to kind of... Uh, to kind of make earnings kind of uh, normalize. So that's one thing that has kind of, I guess, surprised the market. The property business, one, I'm not, not too sure. I don't really go into much detail about Fraser's property. Yeah. Uh, I, I will just move on to uh, which stock to buy due to power supply demand increase. Uh, I think the beta play would be, of course, the coal stocks, uh, which is Geo and Golden Energy. Uh, at this rate, I think Geo's probably PE is probably two times, I don't know, three times, yeah. Uh, and 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 the earnings would would surge uh, because, uh, whatever increase, I think as we all know, uh, whatever increase in selling price goes to the bottom line, so their cost might be twenty dollars cash cost. The coal price might jump from four because theirs is a different ICI four, right? could jump from forty to sixty, so they easily can get another twenty dollars. Uh, which is pure profit for them. So well, the way to play, I, I guess, for me is would be the 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 coal companies, uh, not so much the power companies because it's better they can pass on the higher cost and, and most can't. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, like even you know the, even the Malaysian ones, I think think they can even pass on the cost. So most of them end up having to absorb the higher coal cost. So the only way to play if there's a search would be the 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 coal companies. I mean, from from Singapore perspective. Okay, what, what is uh, the implication of China's power crunch on the stock market? Uh, the implication would be the electronic, uh, would be the contract manufacturers. Uh, I mean, from my angle, I think from Singapore, no, Singapore quite small, right, the market. So uh, the electronic supply chain could tighten even further uh, because, you know, you're relying on, on China for so, so much. Uh, of course, it's a bit unclear right now. Uh, but what we worry is uh, as we move into the third quarter results, like venture and so forth, the, the the supply crunch was already tight, number one, and with this, you could make it even worse uh, because they still need to depend on, on raw materials. Also. And also, number two, you know, Malaysia third, third quarter got all kind of EMCO, MCO. So all this could kind of hurt the third quarter results uh, for a lot of the contract manufacturers in, in a very general sense. Yeah, but but that will be, I guess, the the impact I can see. I'm not sure about some kind of industries, but for, for, they did sold theirs already. I think they sold their China position, so that shouldn't impact. So from what we see is mainly on the supply chain impact indirectly. Oh, okay, uh, yeah, this, uh, how could declining population not impact the property market seriously? I have no idea, but it doesn't seem too much. I'm, I take it as a more like a glass half full. Uh, because when we go into the HDB upgrading market, the usual buyers should be the PRs and new citizens. But it seems to be the locals since the BTO has been hit and all the attractive grants. So if you take it as a half full position, uh, if you look at the number of residents, it actually dropped 50,000, but still the property market is up. So imagine if the resident population, which is you not know, citizen and population, and PRs actually return, uh, it could make the property market even more buoyant. Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, t- again, I'm not sure why too, but it seems to be the case. I can see that the property price continue to, to climb and HDB prices, which on paper shouldn't be uh, because the buyers are usually these new residents. But when I look at the numbers, this year it was down 57,000 resident population, but the HDB prices still climb up. People are still upgrade, buying HDB, probably because of the BTU, I guess. But it's a very good question to bring it up. Huh? Uh, hi, Paul. For Q&M performance in the portfolio, does it take into account the bonus issue and performance? Uh, yes, I actually double-checked. Uh, what, what Bloomberg does is that you know, once there's a bonus issue, they will repack all the all historical prices to the new levels. But it's just that when you have the capital land investment, you know, then it's a bit tricky because they won't have the historical for capital land investment. So that one we had to manually uh we had to manually calculate. Uh is the investment thesis for Thai Berry still remains any impact? Yeah, the headwinds is is going to be the, the whole COVID situation. Uh, that will restrict dining, restrict out, out movement. But the only good thing for Thai Bev is, uh, you know, 90% of the business uh, profit comes from spirits, which is consumed in the, you know, by, by farmers, you know, inverted commerce. And, and, and those probably less restrictions, and most of them are di- uh, consuming it at home. And I don't think they're going to clamp down on restrictions. There's so much of it anyway. Yeah. I hope that that helps. Oh, okay. Um, hi, can you share some insights, please? So much news on commodity prices increase, uh, increasing recently. How come Wilma is still down? Uh, I, I don't cover Wilma, but I can just share with you uh, the Malaysian palm oil companies. Uh, because Wilma is a bit different animal, right? But uh, despite the jump in palm oil price, you, you will notice that the Malaysian palm oil companies, the price, share prices don't move much. Uh, and, and that's because people still think of it as just a one-off. That palm oil price is rising because there's a, there's a manpower crunch, right? Because to harvest palm oil, you really need foreign workers right? because you got to go you know, take the rod and go cut this, this fresh, uh, fresh fruit bunch. Right? So I think that could be the reason. Uh, again, I don't really... Uh, there's a lot of complexity you know, because there's also soybean, but that is one of the reasons. So even the Malaysian palm oil companies are not moving at the share price. Right? That's because people just view the, the search in palm oil as just a short-term phenomena. Yeah. Uh, I, I hope this, this, uh, this helps. Uh. Uh, and anyway, the rise in commodity prices has been more on the energy complex rather than on agri, uh, agri prices. Okay, I, I think... Uh, yeah. Oh, I think we can... Can the rest take on some yeah, things? I'll take the question on what reach should we focus on from now? <clears throat> um, okay, so our top picks currently are um, Escort Residence Trust as well as uh, Fraser Center Point Trust. Um, but if you're, if you're talking about um, other sector picks, we also uh, like um, Ascenders, uh, also, also Capital DC. Yeah, Capital DC is actually, according to our calculations, um, the total return for this year is expected to be about um, 31.9%. Provided, of course, um, if Capital DC does, um, the share price starts to recover. Yeah. So in terms of in terms of our sector outlook, um, or subsectors, we prefer the we prefer the, um, retail as well as the industrial. Industrials have been relatively strong, uh, and resilient. Um, and also because of the early share price recovery, they have been one of the most active REITs that have been in acquiring. Yeah. And uh, for the retail, retail side, um, our our view is that you know with with the reopening as well as um, you know the loosening of 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 the of the measures um, safe safe management measures, uh, we can expect that you know there will be a bit of a revenge dining out in the sense where you know people will start to when the group sizes are increased again, then people will will try to you know. Eat out, meet, meet up with their friends and eat out. Yeah. Okay, so that will be a very uh, obvious uplift, especially uh, you know, earlier we sh- we showed the chart on the retail value, retail sale, uh, sorry, F and B uh, service value index. Uh, we saw that you know that was the index that was actually um that was hit because of these um tightening of group restrictions and, and especially during the phase two heightened alert. Yeah, so that there definitely is an impact, and we should we should expect a, a recovery from 
you know, from the loosening of these measures again. Um, yeah. Okay. So earlier I, I said our topics were escort residence trust. Uh, I mentioned earlier why we think that why we like escort. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about Fraser Center Point Trust. Uh, for Fraser Center Point Trust, um, their portfolio of suburban malls have been relatively resilient. Of course, um, in a sense where you know because of the high proportion of uh, necessity spending that occurs at the malls, your your retail, your grocery, uh, sorry, your your F and B, your groceries, as well as your your um, ancillary health and beauty products. Um, uh, so because of this uh, high, higher amount of necessity driven spending, um, and you know, even at, even as the population is working from home, uh, we expect that there will be a higher higher amount of um, F and B transactions compared to, of course, the downtown malls. And even as we progress back towards uh, a work from office mode. Um, you know, the, the trans the, the, uh, the foot traffic that comes from, from your, day, your, your daily commute, that will also lead to uh, incidental spending at, at the suburban malls where, where you know, people pick up their, their meals on the way home from work or their breakfast when they go to work. Yeah, so that, that will also... So we are of the view that you no, know, regardless of which which mode of working remains default, whether it's work from home or work from office, um, you know the 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 re the suburban retail malls will still um, be relatively resilient. Okay. Um, there are some questions here with regard to um, data center reads. Um, is this still a good investment, which is better, Capital DC or Maple Tree Industrial? So I think for both of them, um, you know, Capital DC, of course, one hundred percent data center read. Uh, although they did, they did um, announce their expansion of mandate to hold other kinds of um, assets, such as, of course, I think gear get towards the, the industrial kind of um, asset class, or 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 even holding some of the data cable, telephone tower kind of assets. Um, and for Maple Tree, they are more of a overall, uh, quite a well-balanced industrial week. Um, they have some, they have some other asset classes, which includes like, like your business parts as well as your logistics assets. Sorry, no, your, your not logistics, sorry. Your data centers as well as your um, factory kind of assets. But you know, most recently, I think about 30% of their of their of their AUM is actually in data centers. So if if you're talking about um pure data center play, you'll say capital DC. And also do take note that the difference in the, the kind of asset, the uh, data center assets that um, Capital DC and Maple Tree Industrial holds. So Maple Tree Industrial, they hold most of them are actually your um, <clears throat> uh, shell and core or your fully fitted kind of assets, where there is where it is largely um, you know a very passive kind of income structure where uh, for shell and core they just rent out the entire space on a long lease, and they will get their you know their annual kind of um, rental step ups or rental escalations. Uh, same for fully fitted, it means that there's very little management um, or services charge in relation to uh, management and re uh, re power redundancy uh, versus Capital DC, where, where a large portion of the portfolio is actually from co location assets, uh, which actually does command a slightly higher um, premium and they're on a shorter, shorter le lease, uh, not, not really your, your 10, 10, 15, 20 year kind of leases. Yeah, but that also means that that provides a little bit more upside for Capital DC. A lot of Capital DC's um, co-location assets are located in Singapore. Um, and although there's talk about the, the lifting of the data center moratorium uh, in this year, um, uh, I think nothing, nothing has actually been announced yet. But even if it does uh, get lifted, we, we do expect that the construction time for some of these um, data centers will, will take about two years, three years. Um, subject to, of course, the construction, um, the the construction shortage um, in Singapore, um, and that will mean that you know in the near term we still can expect some kind of uh, rental uplift for Capital DC, especially because most of their leases are their co-location leases in Singapore are coming due. Yeah. Okay, so so that that basically explains the upside that we see for Capital DC. 
Um, also do take note that within our, in our share price for Cabo DC, we have uh, actually penciled in about um, half a million worth of acquisitions for Cabo DC. And I think they have made their second acquisition at the start of September. Yeah. Okay, uh, another question here about what is your view on pure retail REITs like FCT in view of the current wave of local COVID-19 cases? So I touched earlier on why we think that the, F the suburban malls will remain resilient. So now I'll just touch a little bit more about the, um, the current cases, the current wave. So as, as mentioned, I think the the F and B operators in um in Fraser Center Point Trust they will be hit um because of this uh two packs two packs um dining restriction yeah okay um there's another question here where we'll escort fall to <laughs> 85 cents per share. Uh, can't really answer that for you. Maybe Weiren can can talk a little bit more about that. Yeah. Okay, sure. I uh I, I think I just noticed some of the technical question uh earlier on. Uh pardon me just now I was like typing out some of it because I noticed that there's an influx of questions. So I just want to clear them uh as much as possible. And plus um there was some issue with my mic early on. But anyway, let's start with IFAS first. Um so for IFAS, right? Um the um the correction has started since it, it like it forms a shooting star. And then um at ten dollars one once it reached ten dollars and then selling just came, um actually this is the resistance and support that um at nine dollar and seventeen region uh, okay but uh judging from the divergence that we we see over here and the falling wedge um likely we are see we are see going to see a, a, a further sell off um down and then major support zone at seven point five six and seven point eight nine should be the one that is holding up the price um in in that regard. Okay, um, so let's move on to um, capital DC reads. So capital DC, right, uh, this is actually, um, we can see that there's a prolonged kind of like correction going on. So uh, hence I would say that the, the deeper retracement and the support we are going to see is at $2.22, $2.28 going forward uh, that, uh, on that. Uh, plus uh, price today is likely to close below $2.44 uh, uh, resistance line, okay? Um, next one is Fraser Center Point Trust. Um, not much of a, of a technical signal that you can observe from that. Um, price has been moving very slowly. Volatility has been like uh, on, on hold. So not much, although it has been uh, resting on the support zone between 222 to 2230 for, for quite a period of time, but it's not going, it's not going anywhere. So um Fraser Center Point is kind of like on hold. Uh ARA logos, um, price has a double top. Uh initially there was a panel like formation, but it has been broken. Um prices have broke 0 0.905 uh support support level. So likely it's going to become a resistance line if it, if price is going to fall further. Um, next target to be seen is 0.850 uh, going forward. Uh, do take note that there was a, a huge divergence, a larger divergence and a mini divergence. So hence, this uh, correction will likely to persist on, um, given the fact that it has been on, on a bull run for, for quite, quite a, quite a um, fair bit. So I think someone asked about Escort. So Escort, right, um, we are seeing a, a retest of the support zone between 0 0.860 to 0 0.900. Uh, Death cross has been uh, monitored. Um, the ascending triangle is invalidated after it broke off the, um, the, the, uh, the, the lower boundary of the trend line. So hence, um, let's see if this support zone at 0 0.86 to 0 0.90 will it be supported or not. All right, so uh, that's all. I pass my time back to my colleague. Thank you.
Um, hello, this is Vivian here. Uh, maybe I'll take the question on Lipo Mall's uh, Indonesia Retail Trust. So during the last briefing that we attended, which is for Q2 in August, um, they were cautioning against the, um, the restrictions imposed by the Indonesian government. And back then, the COVID, daily COVID cases were around, I think, um, around 20,000 a day. So it has since dropped to now, I think daily cases are around 1,000. And this is low, even lower than the um, daily cases during the Q2 period. So um, in mid of August, uh, sorry, in, in the middle of August, um, they actually announced the reopening of um, a few malls. And a week later, they announced um, further reopening of retail malls. So currently, um, or by the end of August, there were um, a total of 19 retail malls and five retail spaces uh, that were reopened. So um, with that, even though, with, with the reopening, they announced that, um, of course, the restrictions would still be in place. And that means 50% um, capacity. And for dining, it was at 25%, subject to two, per two persons table with um, 30 minutes dining time and also visitor age restrictions. But um, this would, of course, be more positive for um, looking forward, especially with the continued um, downtrend in COVID cases and also the increasing rates of um, population that is fully vaccinated. Yeah, so um, for Q3, which is ending in September, um, I think only September would see, they would see a more um, substantial revenue contribution. But moving, going forward, um, I think it would be more positive for them as um, with lower cases, then we will, I think, expect the government to possibly um, relax the restrictions further. That's all for um, Lipo Moss. Um, thank you. Pass back the time. Okay, okay let's take a few more before we, 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 we end it. Um, uh, views on Gidi Auto. Yeah, sorry, we don't cover. I think you need to ask our Hong Kong analyst for that. We don't cover Gidi Auto. Uh, what's your view on IFAS as its price has pulled back? Um, uh, Okay, we just share whatever we we know. I mean, we we are not uh, we don't have coverage. But I think the main news will be about their EMPF contract, which is the big unknown in the market. As you, as you recall, they secured this EMPF, the the Hong Kong's equivalent of uh, our CPF contract. Uh, but the thing is that they announced that they will be making uh, they will give details of and of the contract by end of this year. So maybe there could be one last pop once this is announced, because this could be just a one-off gain. Uh, because if I recall, they mentioned this contract is a, I, I'm not sure, I think it's like eight or 10 years. Of, um, the, no, don't hold me to the numbers, but it's a, it could be a, uh, it's like a system integrator job for a couple of years. They don't actually own the platform. So it could be just, uh, you know, for a project, they're earning some fees. Uh, and then the next driver would be the, the whole vibrancy of their, you know, the whole financial markets, you know, their, their stockbroking arm and, the, and their wealth management uh, business, which I think this year could be a bit softer, at least the third quarter, judging by the volatility and volumes. Uh, so that could be the, the one major catalyst left. Again, I'm, I, I, know, uh, I don't cover this talk, but I, I think that was all the news I, I, from what I understand. Uh, the next one is, what are your views generally on the sets? Is it a reopening play, the impact on the CEO? CEO? Um, I, I think impact on CEO, you, you know, is, uh, I, I, um, for me, you know, I don't think one person is going to make much difference. <laughs> but anyway, I uh, shouldn't say that. But anyway, um, the views on, on sets, uh, as a reopening play, uh, if, if you compare to sets prior to, like 2019, like December 2019, before we opened, the stock was about 450. Now it's about 420. Yeah, uh, I for me, if I want to do this reopening, like what price has dropped the most since end 2019 would be something like Genting and so forth. Yeah, but it would definitely be a reopening. I think sets, uh, uh, sets will benefit because, uh, as you know, as more activity in Changi, which is like almost zero now, uh, they will definitely be a big beneficiary. Uh, they will also be uh, uh, they're also handling all the freight which is which is doing well right now and the third one is will be as they as they pivot the business more into industrial catering especially in in china uh, so they, they are moving to more industrial catering you no know, supplying uh, uh, food su food supplies materials to restaurants and and so forth 
uh, and of, of course also to the airlines and so forth, to building building a new business out of China. So that would be some of the things. But they are obviously a reopening play. But just, just when you look at their share price compared to the pre-pandemic, it seems like almost those levels. Huh? Yeah, I mean, this is just my own view. Uh, any chance for Yoma to come back? Or, or that, this is a really, uh, yeah, this is a really tough one. Uh, yeah, it's going to be very challenging. Yeah, it's the, it seems to be the, the, the different, the political situation that shows no signs of improving. Yeah. And, and until you get some form of, of election and which the other opposition were probably going to dispute too. Yeah, it's going to take a multi-year, probably a multi-year uh, before any, you see any recovery. Again, this is just a guess. Of course, you're talking about politics. Right? But I'm just trying to answer as much as I can. Uh, should I continue to hold Riverstone? Uh, I, I think the, it will be a bit challenging because you're going to, the, the numbers could be weak. I think we saw Top Girl Fatalega's numbers who have been weak year on year uh, in the coming third quarter. Then we think there'll be another weak number in the fourth quarter. Probably only some stability in the first quarter of 22. Only the March quarter. That's the time when most think the prices might be a bit stable right now. Because now there's virtually no one wants to order gloves right now because the prices keep falling. So, uh, so the inventories are very lean, but nobody still wants to order because uh, prices are falling. And then you no know, Malaysia start restarting production, so that could add further uh, uh, supply pressure. Uh, it could probably only a bit. Hopefully, maybe in the first half of next year. Okay, I think uh, we try, uh, again. We're just trying our own views. Uh, yeah, we share the outlook on shipping industry. Shipping stocks such as Costco are dropping despite high shipping rates. Uh, I, I don't look at uh I, sorry, I don't really look at at at, at Costco, but I, I think maybe people I'm not sure. I really can't really answer. I don't I've not seen the latest container rates, so can't can't help you on 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 that. Yeah, sorry for that. Uh, 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 hi hi Paul. What is the link for Philip Hong Kong analyst reports or webinar? Um yeah, thanks for that. I, I think you can go into our stocks B and B website. Uh, we have a tab there on Hong Kong stocks. So some of the analysts are there. So uh, we're not very familiar with their names, but if you go there, maybe you can uh, look at some of their reports and some of the analysts there. Yeah. A apologies for that. Or you can just ask you know, our, the trading rep or our global market desk. So these are the ones that can give you maybe some familiar, some names of Hong Kong analysts. Yeah. Okay, I think we managed to answer most of it. What's your views on Maple Tree? Uh, Natalie, you got anything? Yeah. Uh, for, for Maple Tree North Asia Commercial Trust, um, we don't really follow very closely. So uh, I won't comment on that. Um, the next one is... Uh, what is the prospect of Dasin Retail Trust, Hutchinson Port, and Yoma? Um, so for Dasin, I think currently uh, we're we are actually um, getting a little bit more pessimistic about Dasin. They are, the, the main overhang would be, of course, the refinancing of their loans, which are now due in, in December. Um, recently, I think um, they, they were supposed to pay out their dividends on on the 28th of September, but I think they they actually announced that they will be there will be a slight delay and they will pay up um today, Mon 4th, 4th of October on Monday. Um so I think that actually that actually resulted in an SGX query where they explained that um it was it was due to some um basically some paperwork issue where they actually needed to sign and witness it in, in one country and then yeah so so that resulted in a delay. So I think overall the truthfully the main overhang would be the the refinancing of the of the loans. Yeah. Uh, and, and as mentioned earlier or uh, uh, before, I think that overall the the recovery the recovery in the China retail space um it has been it has been relatively stable and yeah, I think in terms of rental outlook, Dasin's rental outlook is still relatively um, soft. Um, we don't expect um, any 
major or a rental uplift for, for Tassin. Yeah. Okay. Um for I think the last question for me would be what what any uh, what's the forward outlook for ESR read? Um okay, so for ESR read, let me see if I can pull up my case. Okay, for ESRE, I think what, what they were mentioning um, in earlier in earlier sessions was that they uh, were hoping to be able to convert one of their assets into a um, data center. They were quite uh, optimistic about that. And also, um, I think there's still, there's still quite a bit of room for their portfolio to, in terms of occupancy. So one of the, one of the uplift or catalysts for ESRE will of course be a growth in, um, in, in their occupancy level, um, as well as any more acquisitions to come. Yeah. And if they were able to, and if they were able to refer, uh, convert or you know, get approval to convert one of their assets into a data center or, or yeah, a portion of the, a portion of the asset, um, then that will obviously be a uplift for ESR as well. What is the worst scenario for Tassin if it fails to refinance? So um, all of us, all, all 100% of Tassin's assets are actually um, uh, have actually been pledged to the bank. So the worst case scenario that is that um, you know they they are, Tassin will, will not be able to sell the assets. Um, the one who will actually trigger the sell sale of assets will be the bank because the assets have been pledged to the bank. So the worst case scenario is that they have no they have no recourse uh, if if they are unable to refinance the loan and the bank um, takes back. The, the the assets uh, forecloses on the assets, yeah, and then I, I guess that would mean that you know if if the if the bank sells the assets, then um they will have to they will they will first of course take the first cut to repay any outstanding loans before any of the of the funds from liquidation are left for the shareholders. Okay, I think that's all for me. Oh, okay, thanks. I think we will try to just finish off with these two questions. Thanks, everyone. Uh, oh, any latest on Razor? Sorry, we, we don't cover, I mean, apart from me, uh, I just bought their mouse. But anyway, uh, apart from that, I really don't uh, don't have much update because we don't really look at the the, the stock. Uh, so, so sorry, we don't really cover. So can't give you give you any uh, clear views on it. Um, uh, any upgrade of StarHub for 20, 2021, 2022? Uh, okay, uh, StarHub... Uh, uh, Looks interesting. Uh, I think it looks interesting in the sense that uh you no, know, you are getting paid four percent dividend yield, and with there's a opportunity for earnings to pop maybe twenty percent or thirty percent when roaming returns, which I do not know when. So as you wait for this, you're going to be paid four percent yield. Potential earnings pop 20 30 percent in you know in I'm not sure in maybe in two or three years, I'm not sure. And the third thing is that they have a cybersecurity business which could get re-rated. I mean, if they start to decide to IPO this or restructure this, you know, cybersecurity is so hot. So uh, there's a bit of hidden catalyst in StarHub. At the same time, you, you are enjoying a good yield. So, so that's my, our take on StarHub. Uh, but our official call is still neutral because uh, we've not upgraded any numbers. But it looks interesting in that sense. Uh, there's one way to view StarHub. Okay, the last one. Um, will consumer staple stocks do well in the environment? Uh, they can do well if they, uh, number one, they need to be able to have pricing power. So, so I was in the Del Monte, just to give you some perspective, I was in the Del Monte call because they are consumer staple, right? They, they sell canned, they canned tomatoes or canned beans. So what they mentioned was all the increase in tin price, uh, food price, actually going to hit their bottom line by 60 million US dollars. So, so no choice if you then they have to raise prices. If you don't raise prices, you're gonna get hit by no just 60 million, your profit all can be wiped out. So uh, only those that can raise price is key, and, and most of them can uh, think, and they raise price without any impact to volume. Uh, the second thing is that uh, with hybrid uh, working place now, I, I, I think we have to take a behavior might change. So consumer staples might have that added lift. Uh, because hybrid, if hybrid work stays, I mean, not at this kind of level, but even an improvement in hybrid 
consumption at home could be much higher than people think. Then in the past, I mean, because more people will be working, not as much as now, but they will still be working much more than pre-pandemic levels. So both these factors could actually help consumer staples. Trend-wise, uh, again, these are all hypotheses uh, because it depends on which company can raise price and, and so forth. Uh, yeah, but that's uh, oh, sorry. That's, to, that's a very long answer. But anyway, they should be able to do well in the this current environment. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, think, thank, thank you everyone for staying back and and yeah, and all your questions. Uh, we, we hope to see you next week or maybe in our in our uh, strategy on the this Saturday 10 a.m. If you have the time, of course. Yeah. Anyway, thank you everyone for for your time. Uh, we hope everyone stays safe and and have a good and especially prosperous week ahead. Thank you everybody. Take care. Bye.